Hey guys, Jamie Ray with Jamie Ray Vintage here. I'm sitting here in my chair because I'm coming to you to talk to you about furniture flipping. So I put on my comfortable clothes and I decided we'd have a little chat. So I get asked all the time, how do you know what to flip? How do you get into the business? How do you make money? How do you price stuff? So I just thought I'd lay it all out on you and let you know what I do. I feel like it's really kind of not a generic form because it's not going to work for everybody depending on where you're located what things go for what your skill level is that's going to maybe make this a little different for you than for me but i just thought i'd tell you what works for me all the different revenue sources that i have and how i'm making it work for zeb and i both to do this full time okay so first and foremost i flip furniture where do i buy my furniture at i get asked this a lot and i i always want to answer this magical place where they have buffets and french provincial and all these beautiful farmhouse finds for a dollar the same place everybody else finds them i go to facebook marketplace i go to thrift stores i find stuff on the side of the road um, like twice a year they in in where I live in Salt Lake County if you go up to Salt Lake County They have trash pickup and so I'll find stuff on the side of the road and once people figure out what you're doing You'll get these calls texts private messages. Hey, I got this for free. My grandma's moving She's got this for free. You want this for cheap? Lots of good stuff comes from that. It does get a little awkward when people want you to pay like full retail price for something I have to explain to people. I'm a picker so something that you might sell to somebody else for $100, I'm gonna pay like 20. Because if you don't buy things for a low enough price, you're not going to make enough money. If you pay 50 or $100 for an item, it better be something that's gonna make you anywhere from like 400 to like $600 because otherwise by the time you add labor and paint and repairs and the time it takes you to market it there's just not enough money in there so keep that in mind when you're looking for pieces it might be the most beautiful piece of furniture in the world but if it costs too much money just keep on scrolling because there's always something else tip number two have a vehicle big enough to get stuff home in I cannot tell you how many people I see, they're like, I drive this little sedan and I want to flip furniture. Unless you want to flip little end tables and chairs, which is fine, but not going to make you enough money to live off of, you've got to have an SUV, a wagon, a trailer, or some good old ropes that you can tie stuff on the top of your car with because you have to have a way to get it home. Secondly, you need to consider having a way to deliver furniture. If people are buying a piece from you, not everybody's set to pick it up. So definitely charge a delivery fee, something that makes it worth your while, and have a way to get that furniture to those people. If you're a single person, sometimes I know that that can be kind of hard, but maybe you can work it out where they've got somebody there to help you unload and get it in their home. But you need to be able to be a little flexible on that so that way you can help get it to them. Okay, number three. I painted something bright fuchsia and it just won't sell. Here's the deal. You have to paint pieces that are gonna appeal to the masses. I'm not saying you have to paint everything white, but if you don't have space to source, store something for six months, you might consider what the current trends are. I know a lot of people that paint really bright stuff and they sell it nationwide and they've got a name for themselves and that's great. You should stick to something that works for you. But don't expect to paint something neon green and think people are gonna line up to put it in their house. If you'll notice the things that I paint, I paint a lot of white, neutrals, gray. A lot of my bigger pieces, I try to keep very neutral because those aren't something people are gonna wanna really experiment with. When I do paint something a bright color, I just know that it may or may not sell. Um, and like, I'll show you a picture. This hutch here, it was gray. I painted it gray because I was being lazy and gray covers easy. Guess what? Crickets. Nobody wanted to buy it. So I sucked up my pride because it'd been about three or four days, which some people may not seem like a while, but for me, something hasn't had any interest in three or four days. It's taken too long. So I sucked it up and I painted it white, gone. Just something to keep in mind. You can certainly do whatever works for you, but you need to come up with a style that is uniquely you. I feel like when people see my pieces on social media and they see that it's for sale, they know that it's a Jamie Ray vintage piece. One, because of the way that it's staged, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and two, because it's my style. I used to try to do things that would fit what other people liked, but then I realized, you know what? 
I'm gonna do what I like, what I would like to put in my home. So a lot of my pieces are pretty heavily distressed, they're chippy, they're kind of a farmhouse vibe because that's what I like. And you know what? People buy it. Four, social media. If you are not on social media, get on social media. I will give you all the social media I am on. I am on YouTube, because you're watching me now. I am on Facebook, I am on Instagram, I am on Twitter. I think I have a Tumblr account, but I don't really use it, so scratch that one. Um, and then I also have a website with a blog on there. I don't do a lot of writing on it, but in my blog, I keep all my YouTube videos, and I like to do, I do like TV appearances maybe a dozen times a year on local like news channels and stuff, and I keep all those links in my blog. It just kind of keeps everything up and organized. Um, I do suggest having multiple multiple revenue sources. So I flip furniture, which we've talked about a little bit, but I also have a website. So this may not be for everybody, but if you're wanting to get in it full time, if there's a particular brand of paint that you love to use, you might consider being a retailer. So that way, when people are copying your ideas, which is definitely gonna happen if you're good, you may not make money off of them buying furniture, but you will make money off of them buying your products because people want to know how to get that look. I help people figure out how to paint furniture and if they want to paint like me, they use the product. So I sell the things and I don't just sell them just because I want to make a dollar. I sell them because these are the products I'm really using and I want people to be able to get the same results and the same colors that I'm getting and if they're using the same products I'm using, they're able to do that. So my website is a way that people can purchase those products from me. Now we've recently expanded and my website includes more than paint. We've added home decor because people want to style things the way that I've styled them. So I've got home decor in there and we're starting to move into like furniture that can be shipped. We're working on learning how to ship furniture nationwide. Right now we're using UPS and UShip are the two different um, companies that we've been using. Another thing that you may have noticed is we put things on our website that we can replicate. Some people put one of a kind pieces of furniture and that's great, but I'm not willing to put the energy into relisting every time I do a piece of furniture, but I will put on my corbels, my candlesticks, my home decor, things that I can replicate over and over again. All right, number, what are we on Zeb, five? Five. We're on number five. So you've been listing on the marketplace, you've been listing on social media, but you still need to get more exposure and meet people and bring them to you. A great way to do that is to find a local market, whether it's a flea market, a vintage market, or a boutique. But a few things to keep in mind are this. Smaller shows aren't gonna yield as many people. So if you're doing furniture, if you are gonna move basically a whole house of furniture, go to a market where people are gonna come. It is not worth your time to do little venues where it's like a $10 booth and you set up and nobody comes or 10 people come or 20 people come. Go to a venue where you know people are gonna come and they're qualified to buy your stuff, like a vintage market where people are known to buy furniture. I live in Utah and I put on a show, I own another business called Reclaimologist and Other Crafty Chicks, and I put on a market where people come with trucks and trailers ready to buy furniture. Those are the kinds of markets that you need to find in your area, where people are wanting to buy the things that you're selling. Make sure that you have business cards, that your booth is branded, and that you are talking to everybody that walks by, hey, how's it going? Even if they're not interested in what you're selling that day, they might be interested in you. And once they get to know you, then they're gonna wanna know your brand. And everything you do is just an extension of growing your business. Okay, so this is six, but also part of seven and kind of part of five. I'm gonna talk a little bit about booth setup, which works for markets, which was number five, and which also works for having a retail space booth, which is gonna be number seven. So setting up your booth. When you're setting up your booth, make sure that you have a cohesive theme. So look through Pinterest and look at a picture and all the things that kind of go together, that's what your booth should have. Somebody should be able to look at that and clearly see your design perspective. You need to have a sign. I don't care how fancy it is, but you've got to have a nice sign that people can see your name and that name should be the same name that's on all your social media. Don't use 53 names. It makes it hard to follow. Like me, everything is Jamie Ray Vintage. Instagram, Jamie Ray Vintage. Facebook, Jamie Ray Vintage. My website, jamierayvintage.com. So when people come to my booth, they see the sign Jamie Ray Vintage. Also consider either making yourself a t-shirt 
or an apron with your logo on it. If you can't afford like a big old fancy thing, a while back I took my silhouette, I made a stencil out of my logo and I used chalk paint and painted it on a t-shirt. Looks great and actually it washed pretty well too. So just think about branding. Also, make sure all your things are tagged nicely and you might consider just using your business card as a tag because then when they go home, they've got that tag with all your information on it. So that's important thing. Also, how are you gonna take payments? This kind of works through every way. You need to be able to take credit cards, whether through a Square or a PayPal reader. You should also sign up for PayPal because that's really a common way to take payments. Recently, I signed up for Venmo. I don't use that a whole ton, but it's also another option. Cash is good, but if you're gonna have cash, you need to think about having change. Even when people come to your home, you need to ask them, how are you going to be paying? If they're gonna be paying in cash, ask them if they're gonna need change. Make sure you're prepared. So taking checks. Out of all the checks I've taken, probably hundreds, I've had like one or two that I ever had problems with and they were all rectified. That's completely up to you. It depends on how you feel like people are gonna be honest with you. I try to take as many forms of payment and sometimes I do a little this, little that, little this, little that, however it takes to sell the furniture. And so far I haven't had really any problems with it. It's worked out really well. Advice number seven. I just recently did this only a few months ago and I should have done it a long time ago. If you can find a place that has a decent, like not super expensive booth rent, that's not too far from your home, consider renting a space. The things you need to keep in mind are overhead and how much you need to sell to make it profitable for you. And you know what? Just because a place doesn't have currently booth rent doesn't mean that they wouldn't be willing to have you in there. You might consider finding a boutique or place that you like and just ask them, do you have a space where I could put some of my things to help sell them? Would you consider doing a commission or however they wanna do it? I recently contacted a store that I thought was super adorable that was really close to my home and now I have a retail space there. I'm the only one that rents a space there. She has her other things there and it's been a great working relationship. So really consider that when you're thinking about things to do. I still sell from my home, but I only sell things from my home when my booth is full or when it's a really big item that would be kind of a pain because it's an old house. It's kind of a pain to get things in and out. Otherwise, I have stuff there and then people can go buy it from them. They don't have to have 4,200 million weird people come into my house. It's really been a great thing. It's also opened it up so I don't have to be sitting around waiting for people to come pick up items. I've really enjoyed having the retail space. It also allows me to do smaller items. To me, a 10 or $15 item isn't worth listing and waiting for somebody to come pick up at my house. But it is worth it if I stick it in my retail space and somebody's coming to buy a big thing and they find other things that they can decorate their home to create a cohesive look. So eight, this really should have been like a while ago but I didn't have this planned out. Staging and photography. People ask me all the time, how do you stage your photos? Do you see this wall behind me? Zeb, you wanna pan the wall? It's white. It's specifically here because this is the wall where I stage 99.9% .9 of my items. I don't actually keep anything here. I actually moved this chair to do this video. Normally there's nothing on it. So that way when I'm ready to photograph, my wall is clean, I put something on it, photograph, done. If it's a super heavy item or you don't have help getting in the house and you must photograph outside, consider getting a rug. The rug that you see in a lot of my photos, it's kind of red and blue. Um, I got it for $5 at a local thrift store and it covers up the ugly cement and just kind of makes it look a little nicer. And then my backdrop is my white garage door, which is also a good backdrop. So like when I'm doing a piano or a dining set that doesn't really fit in my house, I can photograph it outside and make it look good. Make sure you're not photographing things at night. Good lighting is important. Um, I installed daylight LED lights in my house. That helps a lot. And then when all else fails, you need really good photo editing software. I use a few things. Um, PicTap Go on my iPhone is one thing that I use. Another thing that I use is Snapseed. Both of those work really well either together, I can't even talk, together or independently. And I take all my photos on my iPhone 7 and edit them there. I brighten them and I sharpen them. I want people to get the best view of my item. I don't make it so it doesn't actually look like my item. I just make it so that way the color is as true as possible. The more you play with those editing softwares, the better you're going to get. All right, so number nine kind of has to do with number eight, and I probably should have included it with that, but staging your photos. It's really important for people to get to be able to see the whole thing, but also to realize what it might look like in their home. So a few of my techniques are this. 
I like to have greenery. Ikea has those great little plants with the little white pots. You see them in a lot of my things, I use those. Secondly, some tall things that you can duplicate like two jugs with cotton stems in them, also a good thing. Blue canning jars if you're into farmhouse, that's a really good thing to stage with. Fresh flowers. I buy fresh flowers about every week and a half to two weeks, and I put them in as many photographs as I can. I feel like it adds a natural element, and it looks a lot better than fake flowers. Sometimes I don't always have access to them. Sometimes I'm too busy to get them, but as often as you can have fresh flowers, great. Some good fresh flowers to have. Um, baby's breath lasts a really long time. There's like these um, iris looking flowers. They last for like two weeks. And the places that I get my flowers at are Costco, Home Depot carries flowers, just some place I'm at quite often. Um, we have a local grocery store called Harmon's and they carry the most beautiful hydrangeas. So those are something to keep in mind. And always have a backup of something that you can use that's not real flowers. So I have some really pretty hydrangeas from Ikea. I use those a lot. But you wanna just make your piece look like somebody has it in their home old books that's something that you can keep in mind if you do a lot of tables think long and skinny like a dough bowl a chicken feeder i mean this is obviously if you do farmhouse decor but just something that will take up space but you don't want to clutter it the main idea is people should be able to see your piece and all the detail on it and the things that you're adding are only to enhance it not taking away if your photo is too busy don't do it if you got something on one side and the other side is completely empty make it balanced if you're looking at it and it looks uneven then you need to spread things out and figure a way that people can look at it and it's pleasing to the eye i used to not worry too much about this i just was like yeah if they want it they could just buy it from any old picture but i'm telling you that if you want to stand out from the 400,000 other pictures that are on the marketplace or in the um, yard sale group that you're advertising or on instagram you need to have nice clean photos white backdrop nice um, staging that's not going to be detracting make sure your photo is level and good editing software which I already gave you some of that all very important things 10 if you're still watching you're welcome and I appreciate you so the 10th thing that I want you to keep in mind is be yourself personality matters there's a million other people out there that are painting furniture and there's actually probably people that are better than me don't tell anybody Shh. But people like to buy from me because they're buying my brand, they're buying my style, and they're getting a piece of Jamie Ray vintage. And I know that sounds completely generic, and when I started five years ago, nobody like knew who the heck I was, but I've always been true to myself, painted things that I love, and been myself in every situation, whether I was at a market, or in front of my YouTube camera, or on a local TV segment. I've always been myself. So be sure that you're true to yourself and have personality. Make people want to follow you. That's important. I hope that these 10 things that I've shared with you help inspire you to grow your painting business and know that there's really not a mystery to it. You just have to keep working. Take all the advantages that you can and when people ask you to be a part of things that have to do with what you're doing, whether it's a TV segment or teaching a class or your local home and garden show, anything that you can do, do as many things as humanly possible, get out there, grow your brand, make people know you, and you can be successful. It's not brain science and it's not easy, but you can do it. I hope this helps you, give me a thumbs up, um, comment below with any questions that I didn't answer on how to run a furniture business, and subscribe to Jamie Ray Vintage for more DIY. Okay, I can't believe I almost forgot this. Last but not least, 10 plus one, number 11, is pricing. I get asked all the time, how do you price things? What do I price for custom orders? I don't know, where do you live? How much do things sell for? It's kind of relative to where you're at, but let me give you a few things that help me price things. One, when I first got started, I was a little bit competitive, so I tried to just be just a little bit less than the big guys, so that way I could get my name out there. As I started using better product and learning better what I was doing, I started slowly asking for more money, and now I feel like I can demand a little bit higher than an average price because I've been painting a lot longer than other people. And now there's a lot of groups that will say you should just price everything the same. But here's the deal, if you're just starting out and your work isn't as neat as maybe somebody who's been painting a few more years, then price it accordingly. If you want to sit on something for a long time because people don't know who you are, you can price it whatever you want. 
I always price it so that way I make money and my client gets a good deal and I feel like I'm being paid for my time. As far as custom work goes, whatever I would sell, let's say I would sell a hutch for $425. I would normally pay $50 for that hutch. So if I'm doing a custom job, I'm gonna charge somebody $375 because that's what would be my profit if I was flipping it. Now let's say they want like a really fancy design or there's a lot of repairs, then you need to add that into the equation. How long will it take you? What products will be you be using? Bottom line is make sure that you're making a decent wage per hour. And the more you do it, the faster you'll become. Make sure you have good tools of the trade. If you've got an area where you can use a paint sprayer, I highly suggest it because you're gonna be able to paint faster and better with a paint sprayer than you're gonna be able to do with a brush. So just some things to keep in mind. All right, I'm really done now. That's all I have to say. Thanks guys.